This conference will now be recorded. Hi, everyone. Yes, as you have uh, obviously noticed, I am not Sam Nasser. I am Todd Linderman, a web developer in the Cleveland area, and I've been coming to the Cleveland C Sharp VB.net user group for years. Uh, Sam had a schedule conflict and was unable to host tonight, so he asked me to host. So I welcome you all to this meeting. And uh, just as a reminder, this group meets every month. It's free of charge, open to the public. All the topics are related to .NET. And as you can see, the meetup.com URL is there at the bottom. Uh, when we have meeting space, uh, when we're meeting in person, it's uh, courtesy of Tech Systems. Uh, when we are meeting in person and have pizza and drinks, that's from iNeedo. Uh, prizes are, are from PoSharp, and web hosting is courtesy of NIS Technologies. So participation is encouraged. So you know, feel free to interrupt Jeffrey at any point and <laughs> ask your question uh you can do it in the chat as well that works and when you're not speaking please have your mics muted and really let's make this a round table discussion our feature presentation tonight is azure devops for .NET fall into the pit of success by jeffrey palaramo i hope i got that right <laughs> Uh, CEO of Clear Measure, uh, he's an MVP since 2006, national conference speaker, founder of several user groups, and author of, well, he can tell you the rest of that, but I'm sure it's .NET DevOps for Azure, I'm uh, assuming. So with that, I will turn it over to Jeffrey. Let me make him the presenter uh there we go okay he is the presenter now okay and i am looking at these there we go cool. the right screen the go to meeting had a limit of three screens and i've got six so able to share the application. Okay, so okay. everyone can see the complete slide. Just want to verify that we're good to go on that front? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. If you do have a question, please do it over the microphone. Um, because uh, I'm, you can see I'm I'm kind of simulating, I'm standing up in front of an audience here as opposed to just kind of sitting down at the computer. It kind of helps to helps to stand up and and um and keep us going but my goal for all of you today is for you to be able to take away something that enables you and your team to go back to work tomorrow and next week and be able to do something to move faster to be able to do something that increases the quality that you're delivering and do something that makes your systems more stable in production so that you have more confidence as those systems are running in production with real usage. And um, if you're tuning in for, for this type of talk, then it probably means that, that you do want to get more done, moving faster, producing higher quality, uh, so that you can deliver for your team, for your company, for your customers. And so that's why we're going to talk about falling in the pit of success. Now, the examples and the backdrop of, of the technology platform that we're going to talk about today is Azure DevOps. And it's all of the Microsoft platform and .NET, which is, which is the programming ecosystem that we work in. However, all of, these, uh, all of the things that I'm going to talk about today are, are not something that has to be in C Sharp every time. They're, they're actually architectural concepts and principles and practices that transcend programming language, that transcend the tool that you happen to use. And in fact, a lot of these, I remember vividly helping teams with back in 2006 when continuous integration 
uh, there was just the very first book on continuous integration published by Addison Wesley came out. By the way, the title was Continuous Integration. And that kind of started the widespread adoption of all of these automation processes that have now largely colloquially uh, been, been become known as DevOps practices. And of course, before 2010, the word DevOps didn't even exist. It had never even been used. And before 2010, it, we, we call it continuous integration and continuous delivery or automated deployment. Um, and going back to 1999, uh, we were using the term extreme programming for the people who were doing this type of automation. Uh, and, and so uh, jargon aside, these uh, the topics for today are things that enable a development team to have a shorter cycle time that the the inner cycle time of writing some code and making it work the the next cycle time of a team producing a new build of the software for somebody else in the company to take a look at the cycle time of product management whatever that means for your organization of evaluating a build to determine if it's ready to go out to a customer or for real usage and then the ultimate cycle time which is real people using something and uh, asking for something new or asking for a change and so um, so there's a lot to pack into today and uh, we're gonna go a bit fast a little bit about me and, and what I like to do um, that's my boy right there uh, he's 10 years old in fifth grade and he's uh, kind of got his first flat on a new dirt bike that he has uh, his first clutch bike uh, a Honda 125 big wheel edition and uh, and then on the right hand side that's me kind of getting buried going around a corner at a uh, local amateur enduro race um, my my goal is not to win uh, obviously there's no prize money involved but my goal is to survive um, and I get a good bit of exercise uh, doing kind of this type of hobby so it's kind of fun at 41 years old um, I sometimes I just kind of pull off to the side and take a breather and then start up again. Uh, and the races are about 70 minutes long. So a quite a bit of exercise. That's, a, that's, that's what I like to do for fun. Um, and uh, and uh, also have the family involved. All right, so let's get into this. Um, some some uh, resources that'll help you through this. Uh, I've uh, written, uh, I think I'm on my fourth book. And uh, get one of these for you. For coming to the user group, I want every one of you to have a electronic copy of my latest book, .NET DevOps for Azure. If you'll just uh, send me an email or somehow get in touch with me, um, I'll include my email. Well, there's my email right there on the screen. Send me an email and I'll get you a free electronic copy of the book. If you want a print copy, just go to Amazon or wherever wherever books are sold. Uh, it's from A Press, and um, and it has all the. By the way, just about every um, every graphic and image that I'm going to show you in today's uh, in today's talk has is is in this book and is from this book. Um, and Really, it would be pretty easy to update it to .NET 5 because all the things uh, they pretty much they pretty much transfer over. Uh, and then also from a resource perspective, just this morning I uh, I hosted a webinar on how to move from developer to architect. And about every other week we have a webinar, so you can go to clearmeasure.com/webinars and and the webinars are really just about helping development teams uh, be awesome at what they do. Also, um, I have a podcast that, that's uh, weekly. It's called the Azure DevOps Podcast. So just search that up in uh, any of the uh, any of the podcast directories, and you'll be able to find that podcast. Um, and we got people from Microsoft who are coming on, um, and uh, Scott Hunter is going to be back on talking about .NET 5 shortly. Uh, I had James Grenning, one of the original signatories of the Agile Manifesto, uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and anyway, a lot of lot of really good and influential and, and uh, experienced software professionals. All right, so let's talk about the seven key elements of a DevOps environment. This is when you're thinking about when you're thinking about the 
the, the computing environment that you need so that you and a team of people can make changes to code quickly, not break things, not be surprised because something went sideways, something went awry, the software won't start up now, the software won't deploy, the software just flat out breaks or throws errors. You don't want any of that stuff. And so we need an environment so that we can make changes quickly and we're not gonna have to uh, fix things because we're generating rework. Now, anyone can, uh, anyone can, can make changes and deploy quickly out to production if you don't care that you're shipping bugs quickly to production, all right? What we want to do is have a process where we're making changes quickly, but when, and I'm not saying if, I'm saying when, when we screw up and when we break something and when we make a mistake, the environment catches it quickly because we have these safety nets. And, uh, and so these seven key elements of a DevOps environment will go through each one of these uh, briefly uh, in this talk tonight. Now, um, as we uh, go forward, there is a word that probably every one of you has heard, and it's the DevOps pipeline. And I really, really love the imagery that the word pipeline creates because it's the appropriate image to have in our minds. You have a pipe of water, and the water uh, flows smoothly through it, and the water is clean. If we go to a faucet in our house and we turn on the faucet and there's no water that comes out, well, that's not good. And if we go to a faucet and turn it on and it's like a fire hydrant blowing so much water at us, splashing everywhere, well, that's not good either. And if we open up the faucet and brown water comes out, that's not good either, okay? Same thing with software. If there's no new value coming through, for a two-week period of time, a three-week period of time, well, that's not good. And then if, uh, you know, at the end of a two-week period of time, we have a bunch of changes and it's a fire hose and the users are like, oh, it's changing. Well, that's not good either. And then obviously bugs. We don't want, we don't want bugs. Bugs are not good. So um, the, the parallels are perfect here. Just like, uh, just like we want constant throughput of water, we want constant water pressure, we want a constant flow. We want to be able to kind of move, not, not slow and steady, but just comfortable and steady in our software process and move past an era where we have the stop, start, stop, start that is created by the old scrum sprint cycle. Now, uh, in a lot of cases, some multiple of weeks is good for a communication cadence but it's not good for a software release cadence. Um, it's normal to say, hey, you know what, every week just we're gonna get together and talk about how the project is going and we're gonna communicate together as a broader team, or every two weeks we're gonna do that, or once a month. You know, every, every, uh, every company executive team gets together at a minimum of every month and talks about how the past month went. Every, every team has a cycle that where they kind of review how things went. That is separate from how we need to be doing software. And so it's perfectly fine to have a two week sprint or a two week cycle where, hey, you know what, we're gonna have, we're gonna have a labeled release and whatnot, but in the middle, during the sprint, we shouldn't be queuing up a bunch of work and then just all release it at the end. We should be making a change, push it on through. Make a change, push it on through. And high performing teams that move insanely fast. Of course, we all hear about how the Facebook software engineering team does and all the teams at Google that push things out. They have achieved this and they've demonstrated that the Microsoft team that works on Azure DevOps itself, they have a three week uh, business cadence where they talk about chunks, but when something's, when, when, when something's ready to go, something's ready to go and the engineering team pushes it out and then it's a separate business decision about when to actually flip it on for customers, okay? So that's the, so we need to divorce the concept of releasing to a customer from the concept of the development team being done with something and it's, it's ready, okay? And certainly feature flags divorce the concept of a released feature from the concept of a deployment. Uh, but even without feature flags, as long as something is in a, UAT environment or just ready to go to production, then the developers are like, hey, it's ready to go. It's, it's a business decision. Whenever, whenever product management 
cares to press that button, it'll go on out to production and, and users, uh, customers will start using it, as opposed to the development team saying, oh, we're not gonna be finished with that until the end of the sprint, okay? So um, that's, the, that's the flow side of a pipeline where we have constant flow of water. And the Kanban, uh, the Kanban approach, the Kanban mindset is really well suited to this, where, um, where instead of a unit of delivery being two or three weeks worth of work, a unit of delivery is a single change. It's a single issue on your board, a single work item. The other part of the water in the pipeline is quality. We don't want brown water. And it, it would never work to have this mega filter in front excuse me, in front of every faucet in your house where you have brown water in every pipe and then when you turn it on, you expect some filter at the very end when you turn on the faucet to somehow get all of the impurities out right before you pour it in the cup and drink it. What do we want? We want the water to be clean in every pipe from the source and in every pipe in our house all the way to the faucet. And anywhere where impurities could come, we want we want treatments so that the impurities are taken out and the water stays pure. Same thing with our process for changing the software. Anywhere that we make a decision, that decision could be a mistake. And so we want a counter, uh, a counter activity really close to where we perform an activity and we make a decision to check to see if that decision was a good one. And if it was a mistake, detect it and alert us so that we can see that we just dump some dirt in the water and we can take corresponding action and get that dirt out. We don't want to propagate a problem down the line. And Capers Jones, probably the, our, our best industry, um, our best industry uh, statistician and, and researcher has, has uh, identified where likely sources of defects are. All right, so let's go to this next one. Now, this is a highly shrunken technical blueprint for the structure and flow of a pipeline that's implemented with Azure DevOps services and Octopus Deploy um, and Redgate SQL change automation, it has a continuous integration build, has a three-tier deployment pipeline. Um, if, if you don't already have uh, this or something similar, that I want each of you to have it. And if you just send me an email, then I'll make sure that you get the high resolution PDF of this poster. Now, this is just the top third of the poster. Um, I actually have a, I have a mounted version of it with me here. I'll hold up next to me. But this is, a, this is just the top third. And I'll send you the high resolution um, format. You can, you can print it out on a plotter on a print shop or uh, put it on your wall. It's a two foot by three foot um, architectural poster. But regardless of the type of .NET application that you're, that you're building, your environment tends to need to be shaped this way and, and your process needs to flow this way because this is the process. And, um, and there's a minimum level of capability in a DevOps pipeline and every application needs a DevOps pipeline. We'll go into that. Um, but, but just send, send me an email and I'll get you a high resolution a uh, copy of that, and we'll kind of go into the parts of it. That's the full poster right there. All right. Uh, let's see. Now, let's go from, from the, the venerable SDLC, Software Development Lifecycle. Um, SDLC has a great Wikipedia entry. People were talking about that um, multiple decades ago. And, and generally, we still kind of generally do the same things. Now in the 90s, the waterfall approach was, was, too, uh, was used too much where you do a lot of concept and definition and requirements, and then you take all of that and you do a lot of user experience design or wireframing or storyboarding. Whereas with the DevOps mindset, we still do the same activities, but we do single piece flow. We do, we do the analysis on uh, the conceptual definition, and then we figure out how a human is going to use this and what the what the storyboard of the screen needs to be like if there's a screen, and then what technical design decisions that we that we need to make, or does this does this new request, does this new change to the software, this new feature require us to augment the patterns that are in the architecture uh, that we currently have? 
And then um, after that, we figure out how are we going to test this when it's all done, when it's all said and done. Now, the first, uh, the first line up top is figuring out what to do. And there are four unique types of design decisions that you have to make. Whatever you, I don't care what you call them, but there's four design decisions you have to make, and those are them. I intentionally try to avoid jargon that has different meanings to different people. And the first, the, the first decision is, what are we trying to accomplish? That's conceptual definition. The next decision is, how is a person going to use this? That's the UX design. Even if it's a completely headless process that just move, moves data from point A to point B, um, it would be a if, if if a person needs fresh data in the downstream source every within 30 seconds, well, it would be a usability problem if it took five minutes for the data to get there. So there's still a decision about what the person, what the human experience is going to be like because the software is in place. Even if there's no visual screen, it's how is a person going to be impacted and going to experience this. And then the next decision is, like I mentioned, technical and architectural design, how to decompose uh, the, the different uh, parts of the implementation so that developers can take different pieces and, and uh, stitch the work together. And then the fourth is, is all the test scenarios. What, how many distinct test scenarios do we need to go through until this is, uh, this is complete? And by the way, that, that's the good old definition of done. If, there's, if it's a really simple, happy path, and then maybe there's one exception path, Great, you got two test scenarios, two bullet points, easy, simple. If there's you know, three exception paths, well now you got four total test scenarios. But either way, you kind of have to make those decisions. Now the middle row here is individual development team. Okay, an individual developer slings some code. And then we interact with and kind of push it into a version control system. Then we have a build process, which we'll go on that, that translates the code into a runnable bit of software that is deployable and then we push that into a place that will house the new release candidate which is a synonym for the build the build produces the release candidate the release candidate is a set of multiple deployable packages each of the deployable packages deploys a single running process to the downstream environment and then the bottom here is our deployment pipeline that part of the pipeline that actually deploys to environments now Every application needs at least three environments. You, you, can, you cannot have, I'll tell you one exception to this, but for applications, you cannot have fewer than three environments in your deployment pipeline. And that's because there are three distinct types of environments and you need at least one of each. Everybody knows the production environment, you need at least one of each. If you're doing some Tennessee or, or deploying or hosting individual customers, maybe you have multiple production environments and you put one customer on each environment. Some people do that, but you need at least one production environment. Backing off from that is your manual test environment. Most common term we find for that is the UAT environment, stands for user acceptance testing. You need at least one manual test environment, one UAT environment. You know, a lot of companies have multiple manual test environments. When I say manual test environment, it is an environment where uh, we deploy something, a human pulls up the software, does something, checks something, and then decides that they're gonna file a bug or not. And if there's no bugs, they give it a thumbs up, great, that build is, is good and move on down the line. The third type of environment is the test automation environment. We call that the TDD environment to invoke test-driven development. But this is full system tests. This is for tests that require the software to be fully deployed and running in a properly configured, complete environment. And, and then we run full system tests on there. Some people, uh, some people like to uh, call them acceptance tests or full system tests or end-to-end -end tests. Whatever you call them, these tests test the full system. We call that the TDD environment. And these are for those tests that require a deployed instance of the software. Because a lot of other tests, you don't even have to deploy the software. Unit tests can go straight against the library. A lot of component level integration tests can, can put a few libraries together with a dependency like the data, like the SQL Server database and, and run some tests there without running the full application. But the TDD environment is so that we have a place to automatically deploy, run tests, and see if we screwed up, see if we messed up anything, if we broke the build, if we broke that release candidate. Now, you, so these are the three environments. Oh, by the way, in the TDD environment, it's all automatic. 
no humans are allowed on that environment. Uh, it is purely to automatically deploy build and, and then uh, check it out automatically and get the feedback, okay? And by the way, you can have as many environments as you need to, but you need at least one of each of the three, and you're welcome to have as many of each as, as you need to. If you, if you need six different manual test environments, go to town. You can decide whether to run them in parallel or run them in series. I mean, common manual test environment names are dev, sit, dit, test, uh, integration, staging. I mean, just there's all kinds of common names for an environment where someone manually checks something. Okay. Now let's talk about the process as we um, as we track it on our board, tracking our work. This right here on the screen is your minimal Kanban board. Okay. Now I understand that a lot of the tooling starts you out with with backlog or not started, and then in progress, and then done. That is woefully inadequate. You will have no chance of understanding where your bottlenecks are. Now, if, if you're in a team of one, it just doesn't even matter. And if you're, if you're in a team of two, you know, you could put sticky notes wherever you're, you're communicating back and forth. You only have two people. But, but I'm talking about when you, have, when you have, I would say, starting at three team members and above, you can't keep it all in your mind. And you do need the next level of sophistication. And certainly when you, have, you know, when you have larger teams and then teams of teams, uh, you just absolutely have to have this type of tracking capability. Now, we've taken our four types of design decisions and given each of those design decisions a column because it's meaningful to know if we understand what the objective is, we understand what the goal is, that's conceptual definition. Again, I don't care what you call it, call it whatever you want. Uh, that's, that's my word for it, just in an attempt to not use any existing industry jargon so that I can explain the concept. But it's meaningful to put a card in user experience design if we understand what the goal is, but we haven't yet made the decision for how a person is going to use this or how a person is going to experience this feature. And it's useful there because um, management at some level or a customer is going to come and say, hey, is this done yet? And you're going to say, no, is it, well, when is it going to be done? And what we need to go, and at that point, we need to ask whose court is it in for, hey, we, we need to provide some sort of type of guidance for, is it going to be done you know, today, this week, this month, this quarter, this year? And if it's stuck in user experience design, we know who to talk to because each of these activities needs a clear owner. Each of these columns needs a clear owner. If we have not started in progress and then done, well, guess what? As soon as we have some type of conversation, what we put it in progress, and then when is it gonna be done? And we're asking, a, we're asking developers when this is gonna be done, when really we don't even know how a person is supposed to use it yet. There's, there's gaps in our knowledge, and there's no way an implementation could even be estimated at that point because we haven't made some key decisions that are gonna impact the implementation estimate. And then further, the technical design column, that is the perfect spot for the, the, the person in the architect role on your team to make those design decisions and then break up the work into independently implementable chunks, okay? Now, when I say the person in the architect role, some teams have a formal named architect and, um, and you're running like that. Some people don't even have a title architect, but they have somebody who is the team lead. That's that person. Some people don't have anyone who's named anything, but guess what? You have a person who's the lead. It, it all happens. No, maybe, maybe you're blessing of two people. There always is a person who's kind of running out front and is the bridge and is thinking, okay, how are we going to do this? And is thinking about setting the rest of the team up for success. That's that role there, okay? And then in test design, we've kind of broken it up, and then we're and we need to involve whoever is in product management, whoever whoever was key in the conceptual definition to validate that we've identified the right usage scenarios that then become test cases. And of course, with our engineering practices, we want to we want to code, we want to develop each of those test scenarios into coded full system tests that then run automatically. Because if we set up tests to be manually run, well, guess what? As soon as we perform the work of manually running the test, 
we have just generated new work, which is manually running the test again for the next build. Nothing is gonna kill productivity more than generating new work while you do work. Think about it. You did some work, and just by doing that work, you pretty much guaranteed that you're gonna have to do that work again. That's generating rework, okay? And we wonder why some teams can't, can't get faster, can't be productive, because what they are doing as they're plotting through the workday is generating new work. So the amount of work that, get, that is left to be done doesn't actually decrease. And in a lot of cases, the amount of work remaining to get done increases. And then we look back, we look back to when was that written? Was it written in the in the 70s or 80s? Fred Brooks's essay in the in the book, The Mythical Man Month, he wrote an essay called The Tar Pit. And it is just as true as today. The Tar Pit essay is this weird dynamic in software where we try to take a step forward and the software just grasps at our ankles and we're trying to take the step forward, but the software is just resisting us moving forward. Every step takes so much effort. It takes, it's so tiring. And, and if you haven't read that essay by Fred Brooks, go read the essay. It's called The Tar Pit. Okay? And so all along this process, we want to make sure that when we do work, we are not generating new work to do. By the way, the classical, the classical rework is, is if we make a mistake and introduce a bug in the software, that is generating new work. And that is why bugs kill us, bugs that, bugs that are not caught and then get released and then come back because we, weren't, we didn't even know we had that work. We didn't even know that we generated that work. And now it comes back and goes, oh, shoot. Well, we just lost a, uh, we just lost a man day or we just lost a couple man days because there was, there was a bug and it's gonna take a while to figure out how to fix this. Some bugs are just like typos. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the bugs where you have to really figure out, shoot, what the heck, how did this break? Okay, so um, uh, we're gonna go on to the last half a little bit later, but uh, we just kind of did a deep dive into the pre-code design process. Now let's dip our toe into what we do in the development column, because once something has the test scenarios defined, well, now we know enough to be able to estimate how long it's going to take us to build, because we validated if the current design patterns that are in the software are still appropriate for implementing this new change. I mean, if, if, if the feature that's requested was, hey, we need another report, and we already have 20 reports in the system, okay, it's just another, and we're going to do it the same way we did all the rest. But if this feature is the first report and there's no example of how we're doing reports in this instance and the company doesn't have any standards, well, guess what? This estimate's gonna be different. We identify that in the technical design column where we break it out into its implementable chunks. Now, let me, let me talk a minute about estimates. Uh, there is a big movement, it's a fantastic movement uh, in the DevOps world. Um, that pretty much produces estimates without ever asking a developer what their estimate is. And you could probably do a Google search for it, the, uh, the, the no estimates movement. This is how it works. Uh, now obviously people paying the bills, managers, they need to know if they have some number of dollars of development work that needs to be done or number of development dollars it's reasonable they need to know that and they need to know if they can tell a customer that they're going to get a certain capability uh you know in january or february or march or whatever month it is that's reasonable they need to know that in order to be able to conduct business now as developers there's so many developers that have been wounded about being pressured for an estimate when they don't even they don't even know enough information to give an estimate, but then they give one and obviously it's wrong or things change that should invalidate the estimate, but then somehow they're beat up about the original estimate with things outside of their control. And so the developers are really hesitant, just depending on where they've worked, 
about giving estimates. And so from a management perspective, if you, if you consider yourself a leader, you want to be able to give your stakeholders the answer of when is something going to be ready? And you can do that without asking a developer for how long they think it's going to take. And it's by using this process. It's by, in the technical design column, breaking out implementable chunks. And as you break it out, you make sure that, that each chunk is implementable in either one or two days of work. And anybody in the, anybody in the role that's, that's competent enough to do the technical design is going to be able to make that decision. And if, if, if they can't, if they don't have a plan, if they can't see how that one of the, one of the chunks of work is going to get implemented in one or two days, then it's easy. We don't understand this enough to move it forward. If we move this smoking pile of dung on into the developer, well, they'll just churn on it and they'll stop and maybe they have the wherewithal to ask the right questions, and have conversations, or just spin on it for a few days, accomplishing absolutely nothing. We're just setting them up for failure. So when we, when we come across something where, hey, I just don't know how to chunk this up into something that'll be done in one day or two days, uh, well, guess what? That means that either we don't quite understand the goal or we don't quite understand how a person needs to experience this feature, or we don't yet have a design that will accomplish it, and we need to commission a proof of concept. If something is new and novel, and we don't have any kind of example of how to do that, if we've never done this type of thing before, we don't give it to the development team. We commission a proof of concept. In the old Agile speak, it was called a research spike, okay? We commission one of those, and that clearly communicates to management, hey, look, we don't have the capability to do this type of thing in the software right now. Uh, is it worth allocating some number of hours, some number of days to see if we can discover a way and approach a design pattern to do this type of thing in software? And, you know, if it's worth it. And, and a lot of times that's really empowering to someone in a product management position when, when they love it and they're like, okay, tell you what, tell you what spend two hours researching. I just want you to just kind of go and search around. I want you to research. And if at the end of two hours, you are not more confident in tackling this, then we're just going to table it for a couple of weeks. Product managers love to be able to make those types of decisions, but they don't know where those types of situations are lurking in the process. And so that, that's how simply breaking up the work into these types of columns can enable everybody that's involved with software. And obviously this isn't the sexy part of DevOps, it has nothing to do with all of the sexy automation, uh, but you know what, we're gonna get into that. All right, so at the beginning of the pipeline is source control. The, the version control system and the code, the source code, is the headwaters of the DevOps pipeline. It, it, it creates the water, it creates the changes that flow through the pipeline. And there are some rules. And if you follow these rules, then any of the tooling that are out there from any vendor, it's gonna, pretty, it's gonna work well for you. If you break these rules, none of the tooling is gonna work for you, for you because there's kind of some fundamental assumptions that our industry has made when creating the tooling for build servers and source control and how the branching works and the repositories and the deployments and the packaging. And, and so if you break up the source control, break up the source code of your system uh, in this manner, then you'll, you'll be pretty good. So if you have a software system, the software system can be segmented into many version software applications. But each of those version software applications needs its own version control repository. And every version control repository has one DevOps pipeline, starting with one build, one software build configuration, okay? So a team can have as many, can work on as many applications as you want. A team can own as many 
get repositories as you need to, but it's disaster if you try to have two separate teams that in fact are two separate teams making changes to the same version control repository, much less the same Visual, Visual Studio application. If you're migrating code from another version control system that had a different definition of repository, like uh, TFS or Subversion or CVS, then you're gonna need to break up, break up that folder structure because those systems actually had an entire directory tree of tons and tons of applications and they called the entire thing on the server a repository and then when you checked out and got a working copy, you, will, you only checked out a part of the path. Whereas with Git source control and Mercurial, uh, each one of those paths essentially is the whole repository. So unfortunately, the modern tools redefine the word repository and it kind of means different things. And so you want, in, in, uh, in distributed source control tools, you want one repository to have one version software application. What I mean by that is that when we make a change to anything in the version control repository, we build everything in the version control repository, produce a release candidate from what we built, and deploy it together, okay? If, if we're looking at something and say, well, wait a minute, these are two different things. I want to deploy them separately. I don't want to always build them together. I don't want to always deploy them together. Great. You've just made the decision that you have two applications. Split them out. That's the answer to that. And if you have any, any uh, dependencies between them, then you manage it at the pipeline level. If one of the applications has uh, some code that the other application needs, great. You put that code in a library owned by application A, and then the pipeline for application A bundles up that code in the library in a library package, sticks it in Azure Artifacts, and then application B, guess what? Depends on the NuGet package, just like we depend on any other NuGet library. And then you can share as much code as you want to uh, between, between applications, between code bases. Okay, so there, that is how we do source control. Let me talk about the build process. There are two distinct types of builds. One is the private build and one is the integration build. The private build is what you do on your workstation to give you the signal that you are good to check in, that you haven't broken anything obvious, and that if you push the code to your branch in the version control repository, then it's not, just not a waste of time. Now, one of the best practices is to use feature branches so that, so that every commit to the server from a workstation is to a feature branch, topic branch, developer branch, I don't care what you call it, a branch off of master, okay? And then, uh, and then when, you, when you push that change, then you have the benefit of the server side build, the integration build that is going to operate on your branch and um, we're, gonna, we're gonna get to that in a little bit. But the anatomy of a build is the same as the anatomy of an automated test. If, if you've ever done, for those of you who do test-driven development, or even those who looked into test-driven development, it's the same thing, arrange, act, assert. Or, um, or uh, you know, you kind of set things up, then you do it, and then you, and then you run, okay? Um, and then you assert things. So arrange, act, assert. In order to arrange, for validation, we need to kind of clean the previous artifacts and we need to set up dependencies. And a lot of our applications, probably most of our business applications, there is a relational database or at least some type of data store of some kind that needs to be set up or very little of the code can run. Now I'm not talking about a library that's a calculator application, um, but, but a lot of business applications. And that's part of the environment. So anything required in the environment needs to be set up. And this is where your database, this is where you would set up a local relational database from the SQL scripts and source control. Then the act portion of the build is essentially compile. It's translating from the source code to your DLLs. Um, and then assert, we're gonna validate a bunch of stuff. We're gonna run all of the tests that are feasible to run in this 
non-deployed constrained environment in a reasonable period of time. Unit tests and component level integration tests. And you want to you want to do as many scenarios in that in that uh, style as possible because you have uh, you have the .NET process going. I have to I have to retrain myself not to say uh, you have your .NET app domain because app domains essentially are gone. App domains were a thing of .NET framework, and they're not going to be ported over to they're not going to be ported over to .NET Core or .NET five. So um, those of you who've done .NET for a long time, you gotta you gotta have to switch the memory model because the memory model is different under the covers. Most of us never had more than one isolated memory space in a .NET application anyway, so it was irrelevant. But in .NET Framework, it's always been possible to have multiple different isolated memory containers, and those were called app domains. Um, and and now that's gone, so uh, I gotta get rid of that habit. Um, so after the build, now we're gonna package, and when we when we package. Uh, we kind of make some decisions on how we're going to deploy, and every deployed process is essentially a package. So if your if your Visual Studio solution has a web application project, great, that's deployed. That that's a package. That's going to be a NuGet package, and it'll be deployed as a web application. If you have an offline job of some sort, that is an independently deployed process. It needs its own package. SQL Server database. That is its own independently deployed process, and it's deployed into a database server. That's a package. Now, you also have a full system acceptance test suite. That is a package. It has to be deployed next to, side by side with your TDD environment, so that it can operate and run those tests against the complete software that has been deployed and started up and is running in your TDD environment, and that's packaging. Uh, Azure Artifacts is where you're gonna push those NuGet packages. By the way, a NuGet package, I know we're, we're used to using them as, as uh, library containers and pulling them out as a dependencies. A NuGet package is literally just a zip file with a special uh, set of manifest files and has a different file extension. And um, you know, we lovingly call them uh, Nutkeg because of the file extension. But those are the perfect format for a deployable package. Now, do you need to use NuGet? No, you could use regular old zip files. That's perfectly fine. But NuGet gives us a name that's searchable, and it gives us a version number built in, um, and it's the native .NET packaging. It just works like a charm. And uh, um, there's, there's actually an open source tool that wraps uh, NuGet.exe uh, to make it just a little bit simpler to use the command line to make these NuGet packages. And it's actually from a deployment server company called Octopus Deploy, and it's called octo.exe or octopack. And it's a free tool, just download it and, and you can use it. You, you do not have to be using the Octopus Deploy deployment server at all. It's just an open source command line tool that really makes uh, packaging up release candidate uh, NuGet packages a breeze. Then in Azure DevOps, uh, this is the simplest pipeline you're ever going to have. Again, there's three stages. Uh, you should see that hourglass on the TDD environment because we are running tests after we deploy to the TDD environment. We're running tests. Um, this is what the Azure DevOps configuration is going to look like in the TDD environment. Notice at the notice at the top, we are sending an annotation to Application Insights. We are telling and recording in Application Insights, hey, we're deploying version such and such. And then we actually deploy the database, whatever packages in, in, in this application is literally just a web application in a database. And then after that's deployed, we run a, a built-in self-health check. And um, that is important because we don't know that the deployment actually succeeded unless we ask the application. Nothing external to the application will be able to answer that question for us. We need to ask the application itself, are you up and running and are you healthy? And so in order to do that, you know what, there's nothing simpler than a web API call called slash health check. And it's just a MVC or API controller and, and it returns back an HTTP 200 if it's healthy. Now, how does it know if it's healthy? Well, you just write a few lines of code to kind of reach out and ping each of the application's dependencies. 
No, an application relies on a SQL Server database and the connection string got messed up in the deployment process or the schema change migration got messed up and, and I can't talk to the database. Guess what? I'm not healthy. So we need a little bit of code just to kind of run a simple query to test that round trip so that if something is wrong, we can, we can find out. And if your application needs a letter drive for Azure files or blob storage, or if it needs to be able to get through the firewall out to the open internet to PayPal, or whatever dependencies it has, just write a few lines of code, do a quick round trip ping to each of those dependencies, and now you have a very rich built-in health check that you call immediately after you deploy, because these kinds of things happen all the time. You do not want to know or learn that your deployment is now botched later. And so it, and it makes no sense to run our full system tests against a, uh, a version that got deployed and is broken. We can learn so much faster that it's broken by asking the application, hey, are you healthy? Um, then by running through the different scenarios, and then, oh, now we got to the scenario that required PayPal or something or, or, or blob storage, when you know, a lot of test cases probably don't need blob storage. And it's less confusing and it tells us uh, quickly. Now, the flow for defect removal, remember I talked, we don't, we don't want brown water in our pipeline. We want to find problems every step of the way. So every single one of these activities has quality control steps built into it. And uh, this assumes, my guidance to you, everybody should be using feature branches, okay? So we specify the test scenarios back in our design process, and that's where, okay, now we're finally ready to go. We actually understand what is expected, what is and is not out of scope. We don't have to do speculative development because, oh, this might be needed, because let me guess, no, we know what scenarios need to be supported, and that's what's in scope. That's what we, that's, that's, and then when we grab something, the, uh, our, our lead or our architect has labeled it either a one or a two. And by the way, uh, it's, it's clear, developer didn't have to estimate it, it's a clear expectation. Hey, this is a one, or hey, this is a two. And so when you accept the work, it's like, if I don't understand how I'm gonna get this done today, I speak up. Or if it's a two, if I don't if I don't know how I'm gonna get it done in two days, I speak up, okay? And then, ah, I need to do this understanding. Or maybe the architect was wrong. So either way, um, it's, it's clarity. And if I start going and I realize, oh, shoot, I just learned something and I'm stuck, I'm spinning wheels. You raise your hand, hey, this isn't going to be done today because this, uh, there's something weird here. Let's, let's, and you don't waste the rest of the day. Okay, so it's clear. And then if we've broken it down into 10 items or 20 items, that are all marked one, well, guess what? We've got 20 man days worth of work. And if I've got two people on my team, divided by two, and so you see the estimates can kind of, we can use math, we can count. All right, so let's get back to, to defect removal. Once, once we accept something, we change the code, then we run our private build locally, then we, do, then we push the code to our branch, then our integra the integration build runs on our branch, then we, de then we uh, deploy to the TDD environment, the test, the full system tests run against the deployment that came from a build on the, uh, the branch that we were running against. And we'll talk later about how we're multiplexing the TDD environment, especially with cloud resources, so that we can have on-demand TDD environments that are spun up, used, and then thrown away. But we, we run the tests, and now when the tests pass, that's how I know that it is not a waste of time to create a pull request. Before that happens, creating a pull request is kind of risky. You don't really know if you're ready. And, but with all those tests passing, man, there's so many things. If you broke something, something else would have broken. So you know, hey, I didn't break anything. In fact, I, I, didn't, I didn't even break any details. It's very unlikely. Um, and then, so we do the pull request. And then somebody on your team who is evaluating your pull request uses a formal inspection to approve that pull request. Not just, not just oh, looks good, click, but a formal inspection. 
Capers Jones, who I mentioned before, uh, he, he summarized his research on defect management and defect removal, that there are three defect uh, detection processes that when put together, teams that put them together, those teams tend to have, have super high defect removal and defect prevention track records. And those three practices are static code analysis, testing, and formal inspections. Now, we just covered three different layers of automated testing in addition to whatever uh, manual or exploratory testing that, that, that may be done subsequent to that. And so uh, in a build process, it's trivial to add in static code analyzers. The Roslyn analyzers that are built into .NET, uh, Independ, SonarCube, there's, there's, uh, there's linting tools for JavaScript. Every language under the sun has a command line analyzer that will call out warnings, that will call out errors. Um, and that's, that is a static code analyzer. And you can tweak the rule sets. How you elevate a pull request to a formal inspection is by getting together with your team and just talking through it, say, you know what, every time we're gonna look at a pull request and approve it, what is the criteria by which we evaluate the pull request? Well, some of the standards are, is it complete? Does it meet the team's established standards? Does it have everything, does it have every change that's necessary for the issue at hand and only the changes that are necessary for the issue at hand? Um, and uh, did, did the build and all the full system tests pass? I mean, those, that, I mean, that just gets you to the table. Now, each one of your teams is gonna have a few more things that you wanna check. But before someone presses that approve button on the pull request, they're basically saying, I checked all of these items and on my honor, based on my reputation, all these things are good, I'm pressing the approve button, okay? Um, and, and, and by the way, that last one that I mentioned that I suggested that the pull request includes all of the changes that are necessary, but no extra that are not necessary. I see this all the time where someone is implementing something and you reasonably think, oh yeah, the, the, those four code files are necessary. And then there's changes to code files that are completely not necessary because the developer was in there and, and, and saw something and realized, oh, I don't like that. Oh, well, let me fix it while I'm here. Mm -mm. When you are trying to do piece part um, Kanban style, we can't be, we can't be doing speculative programming because what we're doing essentially while well, if, if we do that we are saying i know that what i was working on was prioritized but i see something and i'm going to on the spot decide to prioritize something above everything else and work on it now i'm not talking about fixing a spelling error i'm not talking about those things that are that are trivial i'm talking about um a a refactoring that's outside the bounds or some other change. And you've seen all that where, or you're working on something and then you change something else and guess what? That's the thing that you break. And now you're backtracking and now you're undoing things when you really didn't need to work on that in the first place. And it's especially risky when you do that and you don't have adequate co uh, test coverage in that area. So that's just an aside. All right, let's get to the deployment. There's a rule here when you're deploying across your three distinct types of environments. You want to build once. You want to build a version once and deploy many. Um, you're, you've created deployable packages for that version number. So you have a deployable, releasable release candidate. It is a candidate for release. Now, if it fails any stage, okay, <laughs> it's no longer a candidate for release. We cross that number off of the eligibility list, it'll never see the light of day. It's got a problem and it's get replaced. It gets thrown in the digital, uh, digital trash heap. So uh, you see here in the diagram that every deployment to every environment goes back to Azure Artifacts. It goes back to our NuGet server that's hosted for us by Microsoft. And we get the exact package that was built. There is no such thing as I'm going to build to UAT or now it's time to build to production. And there's also no such thing as, I need to branch for production. 
Because if you're going to branch for production, well, now you got a branch. Now you're building on that branch for production. Now you have. Now you're releasing a, a build on a branch that you're guessing doesn't have any differences. Okay. All right. Well, let's keep going. Okay. Let's dive into full system testing a little bit and how it works inside Azure Pipelines, the release configuration in Azure Pipelines. And by the way, um, I, I showed the diagram. For people who are getting started with this, I still recommend the visual designer method. I know that you can go from the visual designer to the YAML, um, the, YAML uh, the YAML editor experience and discoverability of tasks and the debug ability is still being worked on. For people who are adopting this and just getting started, I recommend the designer experience first because some of the some of the things that are not completely implemented in YAML, they're just going to unnecessarily trip you up and you're going to get frustrated. For example, working with Azure Artifacts and a few others, uh, when you're specifying which package you want to grab in order to deploy, you have to go and retrieve a GUID identifier and then put that GUID in your YAML file, whereas in the Visual Designer, you have a nice dropdown that identifies the friendly name and then kind of hide the GUID underneath. So there's still some experiences being worked out. So if, if, if you haven't done this before and if you're just kind of getting your feet under you, I just recommend sticking with the Visual, experience, the visual Designer experience until you're really comfortable and then you can make the decision for yourself uh, when and if to switch a particular application to YAML if, if you think that's appropriate to you. Uh, this is what running full system tests is going to look like. Uh, we have a very simple application that that just has it, it, it just does CRUD for demonstration purposes, and we can see with every deployment that we can see the tests and we can go back and look at the tests. Now, a magical feature that's just built into running any kind of tests in Azure DevOps is attachments, test attachments. And we can see the diagram on the right-hand side is a web page. Every time, every time we pull up a screen automatically in one of these full system tests, these are full system. This is using Selenium to open up a browser and navigate somewhere and, and type in text boxes and click buttons. Every time we do that, we want to take a screenshot because at some point that test is going to break and we're going to have a screenshot for what exactly that screen looked like and we're going to know exactly what the problem was. If we don't have those screenshots, oh, now the test broke. Now I guess I need to run that test locally, and then I need to see if it failed locally. It's just going to waste a lot of time, waste a lot of time. All right, let's talk about the three different environments again for deployment. Um, there's all kinds of activities that you do in these environments, but we do more and more the further upstream that we go. By the time we get to production, it needs to be a non-issue. It needs to be trivial. It needs to be boring deploying to production. And armed with a little bit of infrastructure as code and some deployment slots and some different patterns, anybody can deploy in the middle of the day with zero downtime, okay? Uh, and, and so it should be a non-issue. If we're doing this right, it should be absolutely boring, a boring non-event to go to production. But that's only because we've done every single thing many times before in an upstream environment. We never want to do anything for the first time in production. Uh, when we're mapping, when we're mapping our running deploy processes for monitoring, we want that telemetry to go to the same place. Okay? It doesn't help us if we have a log file in one place and another log file in another place and then we have to manually correlate that. That's what application insights is great for. Also, Splunk, Stackify, New Relic. I mean, there's so many great APM tools, stands for Application Performance Management or Monitoring. There's, there's so many great tools, but the one built in Azure is great. It's Application Insights. We use it all the time. We recommend it to clients all the time. And then if you have uh, other uh, legacy uh, log files, the log analytics service can ingest all kinds of other uh, independent log files so that you can correlate all that information together. But if you're only using um, uh, Azure PaaS services, Application Insights is all you need. But, 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 we do need to elevate your logs to telemetry. Logs are more kind of, you know, narrating what the application is doing. 
We need two other concepts in order to really have the information necessary to know what our application is doing in production so that we know if things are going sideways or if things are going well or just be able to see usage trends. And so we need to augment our logs with two concepts that are metrics and events. Um, I, I have a, uh, in, there's a new video podcast that, that I'm launching called Architect Tips. Not really advertising it heavily, but if you, if you search the, uh, um, some of the podcast directories for Architect Tips, then you'll find the first few episodes. We're still getting that cleaned up. Um, you can, you can uh, just do a Google search. And one of them is about this telemetry and events are uh, what the user is doing. Every, every time the user clicks a button, every time a transaction happens, we record an event. And we use the same type of, um, we use the same type of design that we, we implement for our business partners by, by using the Kimball method of data warehousing, where we create these fact tables that are the center of star schemas in a data warehouse uh, database where some of the columns are dimensions and some of the columns are facts. And the dimensions are groupable or filterable. A lot of times they're strings or dates. Um, and the facts are number-based. They're perfect for the aggregate, uh, the aggregate functions like min, max, average, sum, all those, all those things. And so um, we emit events and custom events to application insights along with who's doing what and then what the data is and the region and anything about it. And then metrics is an actual number that we emit. Now, one of the interesting metrics that is not quite built in that you're going to have to add to any one of your, any one of your Blazor or uh, WinForms or WPF applications or iOS applications, if you want to know how many people are actively using the application, that's a custom metric. There's no built-in anything that'll let you know who like actively has a screen that is on at the moment. Any kind of native application or, or JavaScript spy application, anything where you wanna know, hey, how many people are looking at one of the screens of my application? It's custom metric. It's not hard to implement, but this is the perfect avenue. And that way, um, every time, either, either with a heartbeat or every time a user does something, uh, it emits that metric, and then you can go into Application Insights and just essentially graph it on a line graph. Simple, all right? But that, but if, if all you have is logs, you can't ask questions like that. How many people are using my application? How many people had had three failed login attempts? Um, but if, if one of your events is I logged in, then you can. Now, by using Application Insights right off the bat, um, you're going to get so much information, even with Entity Framework and SQL Server, it's going to log your queries. You're going to get a whole mapping of your dependencies and your architecture for free. But if you augment it and add events, then you can pull graphs like this from Application Insights. Uh, this is from one of our clients that has a uh, car auction, and you can see some seasonality in the usages. And that is because auctions tend to be events that has usage. And then in between an auction event, there's very little usage. And so we can, we can with, with check marks, we can say, hey, I want to show certain events. And guess what? These are, these are kind of things. These, are, these came from objects in the C sharp of, hey, this is kind of what the user did. And we just shuck them automatically, shuck them over to application insights. Now, that's a technical term, shuck. And then just by doing that, we're able to get some interesting graphs like this and see that, you know what, it looks like, even with our seasonality, it looks like the trend is up, that the usage is increasing, which, which it was, so it validated to what extent it was increasing. And we could break it down uh, by day, by hour, all kinds of stuff. Now, um, uh, one, of the, one of the things in Application Insights that we showed in the deployment configuration was annotating the release, annotating when we were releasing. And if I go back to this graph, you see all those green check marks across the top. If you were to hover or click on one of those green check marks, then you would see all the information about when 
this was deployed. So those, each of those green check marks means that there was a deployment to production. And we can see when it was deployed, what the build was, we could link back over to full traceability, full traceability back from telemetry all the way back to the commit that generated that build and all the changes in source code. So it really ties everything together. All right, that is a ton of information. Uh, before we take questions, make sure to write down my email address uh, so that you can get the free ebook or the high resolution poster. Um, and um, and uh, I want you to have that. And then I guess we can, we can open it up for questions. Todd, do we have any questions in the queue? No, no one on chat, but uh, feel free everyone to unmute and uh, ask questions. Um, I have a question about telemetry, if you can hear me. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we, um, we use App Insights work ourselves. And what I'm wondering is if we have a system that has like multiple components, so you've got an API backend and a couple of durable function apps. Do you recommend like aggregating everything into the same app in such bucket or splitting them up into separate ones? And the reason I'm asking is now right now we're splitting them. And we sometimes have this real issues trying to correlate events across the whole system. Yes, good question. Uh, the short answer is your application insights operates at the environment level. So every deployed component of your application for the environment should go to the same application insights uh, instance. So for production, yeah, if you have those two durable functions, if you have uh, something, your, your database or data store, if you have a web application, whatever consists of the production environment for that application, it should definitely go to the same application insights uh, instance. And then uh, corol the corollary is you have an application insights for your UAT environment, and you have an application insights instance for uh, the TDD environment. And with the way that you emit telemetry uh, to application insights, it will automatically keep track of what version of the software the message is coming from. So as you deploy a new version, then you'll be able to see, ah, uh, the rate at which, you know, we got these messages changed after version such and such. Now, um, this, this goes to a broader question of how should we segment Azure subscriptions? Uh, I, even, even though um, some organizations are creating an Azure subscription for billing purposes, and then giving access to a lot of people and trying to use resource groups. The Azure subscription itself is the security boundary that is maintainable. Even though it's possible, sort of, they, they say in the documentation, even though it's possible to use a resource group as a security boundary, <laughs> we haven't seen it work out well. We haven't seen it just fall into place. Uh, we've actually seen people fight with it far too much. So what we recommend is using the subscription itself for your production environment for the application and then have a different Azure subscription for pre-production. And then you have the production Azure subscription with nobody having access to it after it's set up because your, your automation is the only thing that does. And then you can, you can surgically go in and, and you can assign to a broader pool of people read access to application insights where they can get all that information without having any kind of uh, co-administrator access, but then have broader permissions in the pre-production or the non-production Azure subscription. So that's that, that's kind of the, the, the broader rule of thumb I would recommend. Okay, that's, that's a very helpful overview, thanks. And it's interesting that you mentioned Azure subscriptions because we're in the process of migrating to a new production subscription right now. So I'm, I may have to bring that up with the team. Thank you. All right, okay, good luck, good luck.
All right. Any other questions? Did I miss anything in the text chat? No. Uh, don't see anything else in the text chat. There we go. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jeff Block here. Um, good stuff. Hey. Appreciate you being fan of the podcast, by the way. I'll have to look up the uh, the new one. But uh, you know the the notion of events and te telemetry coming through App Insights. I guess can you shed a little bit of light on exactly you know is that through the logger are you literally just you know i mean w w what's kind of the general mechanism if you will yeah okay so uh i have a 15 minute video on that that's uh, i don't remember if the team has actually posted to architect tips yet or if it's in the queue um yeah. but but i'll i'll verbally give you the rundown so uh telemetry client is the SDK class name for application insights, and you you want to have it be uh, you want to have it to be a singleton for your application. You don't want to create multiple instances of it, yeah. um, and and so you create that, and then off of that there are different methods, and you can just do a regular log message. You can create a trace off of that class, or you can create a custom metric from that, or you can create a custom event. So it's, sure. it's the same class that you would log anything to Application Insights, and a metric and an event are first class citizens in Application Insights. Awesome, thank you. To dig in a little more. Um, What's good to study for exam prep? I think uh, he was referring to MCSD. I have no idea. I was at MCSD.net back in 2004, and I haven't had a certification since. I apologize. Sounds like me. <laughs> I have my MCSE and my MCSD back then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jeff, uh, I guess uh, one, 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 more, <clears throat> one more question. So you mentioned, uh, mentioned feature flags. Um, any good libraries or, you know, ways to implement that? Um, I guess advice on that. So um, launch darkly is it appears I don't have concrete numbers. It appears that launch darkly has probably gotten the most traction in the .NET ecosystem for when it comes to a feature flag commercial service. Uh, however, Microsoft has just in the last year in Azure has released a Azure based a simple feature flag capability. Configuration, uh, right? Right. Yeah. In my opinion, feature flags as a concept it is is not yet simple enough to be a um, a first level pattern for development teams that are adopting DevOps. Uh, in in my opinion, it, it just it, it depends. It, it assumes that so many other capabilities are in place that if you were to, if, if you did not have the three different levels of test suites, if you did not have uh, the ability to quickly uh, build and redeploy already, trying to add feature flags is gonna create more complexity rather than simplify complexity. But if you are in an environment where you have all the capabilities that I've described, then feature flags is going to take you to the next level. It is going to make it to where um, instead of instead of making a change and deploying the new change to all of your customers at the same time, you can deploy the new release candidate out to production with having the new change deployed to zero of the customers and then have releasing to customers based on customer segment a completely separate decision than the technical act of getting the new 
the getting new version to a particular environment. So yeah, I got think it. Yeah. So so one of one of the challenges that that we face, and, and, and I wouldn't say that we're fully on board with everything you've talked about, but certainly a good you know good good portion. Um, so when we, we create a build and you know then customers you know go and in, goes into UAT or whatever and they're like okay well we'll take those two but not that one and you're like uh, yeah, it's already in the build right you know so you're like you know so I, I you know I don't know how to mitigate that you know now you're cherry picking you're you know you're doing crazy things to try to get those two features and not the third one and yes okay so uh, you, know how, you know, we talked about the test scenarios being the definition of what was supported and what was not. Well, yeah. if, uh, if the software needs to work with feature B enabled and features A and C disabled, well, that needs to be a test scenario. Um, and and we, need to, we need to have a full system test that configures the application in that manner and then runs it through its paces. Uh, and and so anytime we use the system in a fashion that has not been tested before, we're almost guaranteed that it's broken. And we're pleasantly surprised in the few exceptions. That's not the case. Indeed. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I'm talking more at the, you know, individual, well, I guess, you know, definition of a feature is, is, is a bit well, ambiguous, so right? But, there, so. there, there is a pattern that is hugely enabling for uh, for feature flags, and it could be a really good prep. And and I hate I hate all the jargon wrapped around this because uh, when when I talk about the the pattern is a synchronous blocking application bus where everything that the user does is packaged up into a command or a query. Or an event, and yep. and now some people will say, "Oh yeah, CQRS," but then you go and researching all the people that have talked about CQRS, and now we're confused again because we have tons of jargon and tons of detail that's not essential. What I yep. what I think the essential concept that is enabling for feature flags is where very close to the user interface where a person is doing something, we want to capture the user's intent and create an object that represents what the user is asking the software to do and then that object goes into the software and then for a feature flag we now have a mechanism to have the feature flag operate on an object instead of having some code somewhere where in order to inject a feature flag i'm inserting an if statement so for feature flag compatibility we really want to use polymorphism for feature flags, not an if statement. Gotcha. That, that uh, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. There was one in the chat uh, talking about uh, does Azure DevOps integrate with other clouds, AWS, whatever. Yes, it, it does. Uh, does it? Yes, it integrates because there's step templates for the other clouds, um, but. Uh, .NET and Azure Pipelines and Azure are all just built to go together. If you are a Visual Studio developer, there's not gonna be a better experience than running what you're coding in Azure. Now, um, are there other build servers that would do a fine job? Yes, because Azure DevOps is actually late to the game when it comes to build servers. However, they leapfrogged everybody by giving us all free hosted build servers in the cloud and just being able to easily attach build agents. And the others are basically just trying to catch up with that. Uh, JetBrains, Team City, what kind of took over almost the whole market share from cruisecontrol.net over a decade ago. And, but, but then they never made the cloud transition. JetBrains is still trying to get a cloud offering to be stable for Team City. Um, and so Azure Pipelines is, is really compelling because you don't have to set up any of that build infrastructure. 
um, and, and you can you can deploy anything to AWS and and uh, anything to GCP. Now I will I will tell you is that um, once you get into some more complicated scenarios with larger, more sprawling systems or multiple teams in larger companies, the deployment and the environment management capability of Azure Pipelines starts to get a little bit clunky, and then you may choose to move upstream in capability and augment your DevOps environment with a tool like Octopus Deploy, which really excels at the higher level of complexity. Um, so there's, there's you know, different tools for different situations that fit nicely, but, um, but yeah, you should have no problem with GCP or AWS. It's really about your, your, own, your own architecture. One more question, if uh, no others. So uh, database integration, specifically, you know, schema, stored procs, you know, things like that, and uh, tools along those lines that, you know, in addition to the, the actual .NET code, you know, right. we have uh, this whole other set of code in the database. Yeah, okay, so there's a section in my book specifically dedicated to database DevOps. And interestingly enough, going back to 2006, when the continuous integration book came out, there's an entire chapter in the continuous integration book on database continuous integration. And then in 2009, when the book on continuous delivery came out, there was another chapter dedicated to uh, deployments with databases. And if you, do a, if, you, if you do an internet search for database DevOps Jeffrey Palermo, you're gonna find several recordings of some webinars that I've done going deep into this and doing some demonstrations, um, as, well as, as well as being a first class citizen in my uh, .NET DevOps for Azure um, bootcamp or .NET DevOps bootcamp that's that's available on demand training um, but you know there's a whole lot of samples and there was a there was a funny funny joke I saw uh, posted in, in, in some channel that said uh, number of number of online DevOps samples that don't have a database a million number of real world applications that never store any data zero and it's funny because all the samples like to ignore the thing that's a little bit trickier because if something's compute only, we can completely destroy it and completely put it back pretty quickly because we don't have any state we have to, we have to save. But every one of our applications has a database. And so we need a database migration tool. There are three uh, popular free um, database migration tools and there is one very good commercial tool uh, in the SQL Server space. The commercial one is by Redgate. It's called SQL Change Automation. If you have a really complicated database with all kinds of features used with every version of SQL Server going back a couple decades, don't even mess around with the uh, free and open source tools. You need the power of that commercial tool. It's so much more fully featured and it, it, they really do a good job. But if you're building a new application or if all you have is tables, store procedures, views, some triggers, and other things that have um, that have DDL, pretty pretty clean DDL, then all of the all of the open source tools will work nicely for you. The three of them, um, I think, uh, um, DBUp is the most popular. Uh, I'm, I looked at the uh, the number of downloads on NuGet uh, NuGet.org. DBUp is the most popular. The next most popular is Roundhouse. Uh, the third most popular is Alias QL. Um, it's kind of Alias QL is how it's spelled. And, um, uh, and all of those have the same architecture where they, they look for a directory in your Visual Studio solution or in your, in your source tree, and they run all of the SQL files in alphabetical order. So the convention is you number the files and then you order them alphabetically, they're in the right order. And you execute each of those SQL files inside of a transaction, and then the tool puts one, a history table in your destination database so that it knows if that SQL file has already been run on that, on that uh, destination database. And in that way, you as the developer at design time are completely in control of whatever you do with that database scheme. If you're gonna add a column, if you're gonna split a column and need to move some data around, uh, 
if you need to if you add whole new tables, or if you need to walk up to an existing database and script out the whole thing and put it in an SQL file to get started, you are in control of what goes in that SQL file, and every change is a step forward change. If I if I make a table, well, that's an SQL file. Then if I come back, if I come back after you know an hour later with the next build and I need to add a column to that table, that's a new SQL file to do an alter statement with an add. And and that is resilience across feature branches and that that architecture has been proven to be scalable and that uh, that database uh, DevOps pattern uh, is the successor to the older state-based approaches that have kind of lived out their life that, that are tools like Redgate, SQL Source Control, SQL Server DAC Pack, um, and um, the old entity framework migrations. Those older state-based mechanisms um, have been replaced by sequential um, uh, schema migration approaches. But um, yeah, look for, look for that webinar that I did. Um, and I need to jump started. It, database DevOps, correct? Yes, database DevOps, Jeffrey Palermo. Awesome. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. Sure, sure. Yeah, super important part. <laughs> None of our applications don't have a database. Or very right. If I can um, expand on that a little bit. Um, the, uh, our database is currently in a SQL Server Data Tools project, and from what you're saying, I'm getting an impression that's not really ideal from a continuous integration standpoint. And that's actually that's something that I'm working on right now because now I'm I have a process set up to build a document image out of that, so I can at least make sure that everything builds correctly. But my impression is more or less now it's easy to define what I want my end state to look like, but not so much how do I get from whatever state the database is in right now to that current end state. So would that be a fair summary that you don't particularly recommend that anymore? I think that's right. Um, now you may you may have something where you need to continue using DACPAC for a while because it's it's you know 80 percent better than having nothing and it's going to be a while before you have time to change it and the as you're prioritizing what to invest in you want you, you want processes that can run automatically in an unattended fashion and be reliable and do the same thing over time and so um and, and so i think it, to the extent that you're going to keep using backpack there's a lot of people continuing to use DACPAC, and it's just good to understand that whenever you have destructive database changes, DACPAC is not going to know what to do in those cases, and you need to kind of avoid those or make other plans so you don't run into one of the cases and then are surprised that DACPAC didn't know what to do. But any anything that's destructive, if you're if you have a phone number column, and if you have a phone number column and you need to split the area code out. Well, you need to add a column, and then you have a little database miniature ETL, you need to move some data over, and then you need to do the destructive operation. If you just, if DACPAC just sees the, the end state, it doesn't know how to do that bridge so that it doesn't destroy data. So just be aware that there's limitations to that architecture, and as long as you're aware, then, then uh, you, know, you can buy yourself time. That makes sense, thanks. So that's, that's pretty much exactly the situation right in, where I was just prioritizing what we might to invest in right now. But we are, we're definitely trying to get to a, st a state of automated database deployed. So thank you for your insights on that. Sure, sure. All right, well, this is fun. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the invite and being able to to speak to the group. Okay, great. Uh, anybody else have any uh, questions? I didn't see you uh, see any more in the chat. Well, 
Mark. <laughs> Everyone's thumbs up. Okay. Well, uh, great. Well, I think I will take back the presentation. Oops. Share the right monitor. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Uh, we've got some other user group meetings. They're virtuals. Uh, I am not familiar with any of these groups, uh, so I can't say. Uh, the virtual conferences, SQL Saturday, hey, uh, Sam's always uh, talking about those because he's obviously been a speaker at a few of them. Uh, I don't think he's going to be in Montreal or Bangladesh, but again, they're virtual conferences, so who knows? But uh, anyway, be sure to check those out. All the related links are right there. And as always, uh, Sam will be uh, posting the video of this meeting uh, later after he's been able to edit it. Uh, contact info. Oh, why is it not showing up? Oh, of course. These are all Sam's. Uh, oops contact info, feel free to contact him. <clears throat> and I have no idea what the next meeting is. Sam didn't uh, share that with me. So uh, I don't even know if there is one in December, but uh, I look forward to the next one uh, as well. Uh, by the way, I just want to, uh, you know, say the uh, .NET Conf 2020, was amazing what I've seen of it so far. I couldn't spend you know all those hours watching it, but just remember all the sessions are available on demand at channel9.msdn.com. So remember that. And uh, again, I wanna thank Jeremy for a wonderful presentation tonight. Jeffrey, what did I say? Sorry. Not playing. <laughs> uh, so uh, we will uh, uh, just leave the meeting open if people want to chat or uh, talk a little bit more or if you have a few more questions. Uh, but at this point, it will be uh, uh, just open for you. So anyway. Uh, yeah. So, so thank you so much. Family yeah. has family has a supper waiting. Oh, okay. Great. Have fun. All right. Y'all have a great evening. Thanks a lot, okay. Jeff. Appreciate the info. Stay safe. All right. Thanks. Bye bye.